Today we're going to take a look at section 10.3, um, and what we're looking at in this section is permutations and combinations. You may have heard of those before. Um, if you haven't, that's okay. Um, if you are an elementary ed major, you'll hear about them again, because we talk about these again in one of our elementary ed courses. Um, and they assist us in finding counting, uh, ways of counting things. That's what they do. They're, they're ways of counting things, and so they're both a little different than one another. So we'll start with permutations. Permutations is the number of arrangements of n things taken r at a time. Um, you'll notice factorials show up in the formula. So there's a little n, there's a capital P, there's a little r, okay, so npr. And then on top, it's n factorial, and on the bottom, it's n minus r factorial. Uh, and we saw this formula in play, though not described this way, uh, in our previous sections. We saw it show up as something like 20 factorial divided by 10 factorial, and we simplified things down. So the mathematics of simplifying them down, we've done some of, but understanding what it's finding for us is new. <coughs> the key difference between permutations, which this one is, and the next one called combinations, is that the order matters. So there are things in your life where the order matters. There are, right? Like, it matters that you put your undergarments on before you put your outer garments on. It matters, yeah? Um, but maybe it doesn't matter whether you eat the meat first or the vegetable first, right? There are things that don't matter, too. Um, some different ones that we've encountered along the way. Um, do you remember our examples where we were selecting president and treasurer and secretary and so forth? The order matters because your job would be different if you were the president than if you were the treasurer, yeah? But then we had committees, and in committees, you all are on the committee together, and <coughs> once you're on the committee, you might have different roles, but your assignment to being on the committee doesn't matter if you're placed on the committee first or last. It's the same thing. So in that situation, the order doesn't matter. Um, another one that happens um, is, some might say, um, sort of like, uh, Athletic events, races, and things like that. So let's think in terms of like swimming races or track meets, right? <coughs> well, in some cases, the order matters. You doing okay? I'm dying of time. You're dying of. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, you're dying. Don't die on me today. I'd rather have allergies. At least that. leave my class before you die. I'm just kidding. Please don't die at all. Um, <laughs> hey, if I do it in the room, my roommate gets like Not on but, um, my watch. Um, okay, so uh, our. Our, our races. Um, if you're awarding the medals, you know, the first place, the second place, the third place medal, then the order matters in which you finish, right? But think about those events like in the Olympics where they're qualifying rounds for something, right? The top three people move on. Well, you kind of want to like gauge how much effort you want to put into it. You don't want to expend all your effort because you're going to have a race later that the order matters for. Right now, you just have to place in the top third. Right? So it's far more important that you're gauging how other people are running around you or swimming around you to know whether or not you need to push that extra little bit at the end to place into the top three or whether or not third is really just okay and you're fine. Right? So there are lots of places where order matters and lots of places where it doesn't. And you have to make the decision based on the context. You can't just say, it's a race, the order matters. Well, maybe and maybe not. Right? I'm selecting a group of people, the order matters. Well. Maybe and maybe not. So the context describes whether or not the order matters, and it tells you whether or not you're using permutations where the order matters, or combinations where the order doesn't. And if you take a look at this description, this formula specifically compared to the last formula, what is the only thing that's different? The extra R factorial on bottom. It's catching. Sneezes are catching. I know. All right. So, yeah, Elena's right. The extra R factorial on bottom. So let's talk about what this formula is doing for us. Uh, the numerator is all of the items that were, you know, ability to select. So let's talk about this class for now. Let's just pretend like you are my N, right? can count your number, we can figure out how many of the people there are, that's what we would put on top, on the top. And if I wanted to select a group of you, right, then if I'm doing permutation, I promise I'll switch the slide back in a moment, if I'm doing permutation, 
the n minus r on bottom is the number of you that don't get selected. Okay, n is the number on top. That's all of the people or elements that we're talking about. And the bottom is the people who aren't selected. Because if you're not selected, the order in which you're not selected doesn't matter. Right? Maybe you would have been the fifth person selected had there been a fifth person. Or maybe you would have been the very last pick on the dodgeball team. Right? Doesn't matter. You weren't picked at all. Right? So the denominator is all of those items or people or whatever that are not selected. Over here, the R, the R is the number of people who are selected. So in this one, we actually have R factorial on bottom. Why? Well, because if the order doesn't matter in which you're selected, then I need to divide out the number of ways that I could select those R people as well. And that's why it's showing up here. So on part of this denominator, you have the number of ways you could select the people who weren't selected. And then the other part of the denominator, you have the number of ways of selecting the people who were selected. And we're eliminating that by dividing by it. And again, the key is that the order doesn't matter. So the biggest component when we get to the examples is really deciding, is it a combination or is it a permutation? Because if I pick the wrong one, my answer will be wrong, right? So it's really important that we're correctly identifying which process we're supposed to be using. Now before we do that, we're going to do a couple of examples where we're just making the calculations. This is really just one step removed of stuff we've already done. What we've done is actually computed things like the right-hand side of this formula. In fact, we even had one where it was all set up like that. It told, they told us n equals this, r equals this, and we put it in, and then we did the calculation. So this is sort of just taking one step back and saying, OK, now I'm going to give you the notation for what that means, and you have to set it up yourself. OK, so the number in the front, the n, is what goes on top. So what number is going to go on the top of this fraction? 12. All right, so we're going to put a 12 on top. 12 factorial, right? And in permutations, the denominator is the number that aren't selected, right? The, the three. That's how many we're picking. So if I have 12 people and I only pick three of them, how many don't get picked? Nine. Now, if you want to write down 12 minus 3 factorial, you can, or you can simply write it as 9, whatever you need to see. Okay? But it's the number that don't get picked. I have 12 of whatever I'm picking, and I don't pick nine of them. And then we're back to doing the same thing we did in the last section. We're going to write it down until we get to the matching 9 factorial on top. And once I get to the 9 factorial on top, I can eliminate or cancel out or reduce whatever words you want to use, the 9 factorial from pla both places. And I can simply multiply 12 times 11 times 10. What is 12 times 11 times 10? 1,320. 1,320. Is that all right? The second one has the same numbers, the 12 and the 3, okay? But it's a combination. So the starting part is the same. I have the 12 factorial on top. And I don't know where you want to write it. It doesn't really matter. But you do have a 9 factorial on bottom. Like, those pieces match from both formulas. But in the combination formula, we have to include how many people are selected with a factorial as well. So in this case, the number of people or items or whatever that we are selecting is 3. So we're going to have a 3 factorial in our denominator. OK? Again, the process is going to work the same. We're going to write the 12 down to 9. 12, 11, 10, and 9 factorial. And again, that 9 factorial is going to cancel. But now we actually have a 3, 2, 1 on bottom. So my 9's cancel, 9 factorials cancel. If you really want to, you can multiply across the top, write it down, multiply across the bottom, write it down, and do the division. It's, not, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. However, it will always be true that everything in that denominator will cancel with something in the numerator. So you could, at this point, do the cancellation as well, especially if you hadn't already done the first example that looked exactly like this one with the, not without the three, right? The three and the two. So I would be tempted to take this and say, oh, look, 3 times 2 is six. 6. And there's a number on top that nicely divides by 6. It's 12. 
And I would cancel those and say, okay, well, that's a two. Especially <coughs> if I was doing this problem from scratch and hadn't still already done part one. And then I would have, instead of 12, 11, 10 multiplied, I'd have two times 11 times 10. And what would I get? 220. Okay, so imagine the scenario goes something like this. You're at a buffet. And there are 12 different main courses on the buffet. Clearly not going to eat 12 main courses. At least I really hope not. Maybe you take one bite of all of them, but we're pretending you're not. You're going to pick three. Okay? You're going to pick three. In the first scenario, the question is, in how many ways could you eat the individual three different entrees after you pick the three entrees from the 12? In the second scenario, the situation is not in how many ways can you eat them, but just how many different choices could you have made to put on your plate? Okay? That's the difference. Does it matter the order in which you eat them, or does it just matter that they went onto your plate? Right? That's another way we can kind of think of the difference. So, as we're taking a look at the rest of these in this section, we have examples where we have to decide if the order matters. And I will tell you that when you get to the homework, this is one of those things that no matter how many examples I do, the homework's going to feel like, well, she didn't cover something like this. Because every example has to look different. Like, that's the point. You have to make the decision. And to be very honest, if you make the decision wrong, my math lab's going to kick it out, and you're probably going to be like, oh, look, it wasn't a combination. It was a permutation. Now I know how to do the problem. So you better pause and really consider, do I understand why? Because when you get to quizzes and tests, that won't work, right? You won't be able to, in the middle of the quiz or test, just be able to redo the problem the other direction. You have to know which one it is and know it the right way. So if it, if it spits back out to you, hey, this is a permutation instead of a combination or something, please make sure you look back at it and really process why. Okay? All right, so here's our first example. Uh, we have a builder. Josh Hubbard builds homes. Um, there are eight different models of homes. So imagine there's eight different blueprints, right? Eight different styles of homes he could create. He has five different pieces of property or lots to build on. And how many ways can he arrange the homes on the lots so that five different models will be built? It matters that he told you five different models will be built because otherwise he could just do the same home in a row, right? He could just do all five of the same home and the process would not be the same as what we're going to do. But these are not going to be the same homes in a row. They're all going to be different. And the fact that they're all going to be different means that I'm pushed into the scenario where I, I can look at permutations and combinations and it makes sense. Otherwise, I'd be back at the fundamental principle of counting like we did last time and we'd just go eight times eight times eight, five times. Are you with me? Those details really matter. So pay attention to the details in the description. Does order matter? That's what we have to decide. Does it matter the way that this question is worded? got some people saying no, and I've got some people saying I think it does, and nobody wants to be bold. That's okay. Uh, the order does matter. It does. Um, and the reason it matters is because it describes the arrangement of the homes, right? So imagine playing the game where you move the, the containers around that have the ball underneath them. You're trying to continue changing the arrangement, right? The arrangement is different because the ball will rest under a different, a different cup if you change the arrangement. Agreed? It's the arrangement that we're trying to assess here. Contextually as well, when you go into a neighborhood, does it look different if the homes are in a different order? Yeah, it would look different, right? Now somebody might not care whether their home's in the middle or their home's on the end. That's another issue, but they might. Some people really like side lots. Our lot, it's wonderful. It's like pie-shaped, which means our lot, it literally looks like, well, it looks kind of like this which means we have a bigger lot than most people do in our neighborhood because our lot's at an angle. So our lot ends up being um, almost two acres, whereas everybody's adjacent lots to us are about one and a half, right? Well, that's different. If my house was on a different lot, it would cost less money because I have a burger yard. Right? It matters, okay? So the order does matter on this one. So what does that tell us we need to use? Permutations. Permutations. So we have a permutation. How many things do we have to choose from? Eight. We have eight different blueprints or styles of home or 
how do they describe it, models. And how many are we going to actually build? Just five. So on the top, we have our eight factorial. And on the bottom, we have the number of homes that we're not going to use, or models we're not going to use, which would be three. So three factorial. And we will write down the eight down to three, which is pretty far. So it looks like that. Is that okay? okay great. So my three factorials will cancel. Grab a calculator, you're going to want one, right? You're not going to want to multiply this by hand. Let's multiply 8, 7, 6, 5, and 4 together. Good deal. 6,720. Uh, well, they call it arrangements. We'll call it arrangements as well. There are 6,720 arrangements of our homes. Okay, is that all right? Okay, let's look at one that might be a little bit more of a familiar uh, camping ground for you at the moment. Julie. Julie needs to take 10 electives to fulfill her hours in her degree. That's a lot of electives. If you have that many electives, you're very fortunate. My math ed people get like two, I think. It's really close. It's just really tight. Really too. You have 12 electives? Wow. We should all do your major. You should talk to us about that. Creative writing. Creative writing. Okay, everybody now knows, and the writing department's going to be flooded. All right. You have how many? 13. 13 electives. Okay. So Julie is right there with you ladies, and she's very excited to take her 10 electives. She decides to start her career with electives because she doesn't know what she wants to do. A lot of people actually do that. They try to hit some core requirements and stuff too, but we need a scenario to make this work, so it's a little bit contrived. I understand that, but just work with us. Decides to start her career with electives because she is unsure of her major. If no course, no courses, sorry, have prerequisites of one another, and there are 17 courses she is interested in taking, how many different selections of 10 electives could she make? Okay. Now, this one says selections. The last one said, mm, where was the word? Arrange. Can he arrange or arrangements, right? Arrangements has the natural feeling, as we talked about or mentioned before, of the order of mattering. A selection doesn't. And because none of the courses are prerequisites for anything or, or anything like that, it doesn't matter the order she takes them. Right? She can take them in any order. So she just looks at where they fall into her schedule nicely. And the question really is about, okay, well, which of the 10 is she going to take? I mean, which of the 17 is she going to take in her 10? Right? She's going to take 10 of them. Which, which ones is she going to take? Okay? So in this one, the order doesn't matter. Okay? It doesn't matter. So this one is a combination. There are 17 items to take. Um, right, what courses she can take, and she's going to take 10 of them. So the first number always goes on top, 17 factorial. On the bottom, for a combination, we're going to have the number of courses she doesn't take, which would be 7, and the number of courses she does take, which is 10, and whichever one's bigger, we're going to write our factorial on top, to that stopping spot, just because it simplifies us having to write more out. So we're going to stop at 10. 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, and I'm running out of space. Let me move this over. 11 and 10 factorial. Uh, I already have a 10 factorial, and then I have 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, two, and one. And if you don't want to write the ones, you don't have to because one is not going to change the value of anything, right? All right, so I'm going to do the hard part. Ten factorials go away. What are we going to do? I 
you've probably reduced some things. Um, this is getting to the point that it's large enough if you multiply what's in the numerator. Your calculator might start freaking out. And what does it mean for your calculator to freak out? Well, it means it gives you weird numbers that have capital E's in the end of them, which really means it's turning it into scientific notation. That's not very helpful for what we're doing. Um, there is a capacity to your calculator's ability to report an answer back to you. And I don't know exactly where it is, because I haven't played with that question, but the larger the numerator gets, right, the number that gets on the factorial, the quicker you're going to hit that value. So what are some things that I might be able to cancel from the bottom to the top? Seven and two. Okay, seven and two can cancel to give me 14. And it doesn't matter the order we cancel. We just see whatever we see and we cancel it. So what else do you see? Five and 15. Um, five and 15. Can I do five and three and 15? Would you okay with that? Okay. Five and three make 15 and those will cancel. Now what? Okay, 4 and 12. So 4 to 12 would give me a 3, right? Okay. Now, the 6 is not perfectly going to divide by something that's currently written on top. So if you want, you can just multiply the top, divide by 6. That's fine. It's not hurt anything. But 6 is, in fact, 2 times 3. And those factors are represented on top, right? So the 2 here can cancel with the 2 or with the 16 here, for example, to give me an 8. And the 3 could cancel with the 3, if you wish. There's always a way to cancel them out, even if you break it down. So I took the 6, broke it to 2 and 3. The 2 canceled with the 16, and the 3 canceled with the 3. If you don't want to do that, just don't. Just At this point, it doesn't matter. Just divide by the 6 at the end. You'd be fine. As you're working with these, and I'm pretty sure I work worked to this in as a word of caution before, but I'll say it again. They get really messy. You need to write very clearly because you're going to lose factors if you don't. So we have a 17, an 8, 13, and 11. Those are the four values that need to be multiplied when we're done. What is the result of those Steps of multiplication. 19,448. 19, selections. It feels like a really big number, doesn't it? I mean, there's only 17 courses. You're only <laughs> picking 10 of them. Like, how can we get a number that big? Yeah, it's factorials that are playing into that. Okay. My next example um, actually fits the rest of this section. So a bit of prerequisite knowledge in case you don't have um, a, a lot of experience with cards. So depending on your knowledge base will depend on whether you want to write down what I'm saying or not. If you're very familiar with playing card games like a standard deck of cards, you're probably good. But in case you're not, I want to go through a few features. Okay, 52 card deck. So a standard deck of cards that someone would play with you know, go by in the store, a deck of cards has 52 cards. Half of them are red, so 26 are red, and 26 are black. Half red, half black. There are four suits of cards. There's hearts, diamonds, and both of those are red. And then there's spades and clubs, and both of those are black. Because there are four suits, and there are 52 cards, that means there are 13 of each suit. So there's 13 hearts, 13 diamonds, 13 spades, and 13 clubs. So far, so good? Okay, within each suit, so let's just talk about hearts for the moment. There are number cards. The number cards start at two and they go to 10. There's no one. Two to 10 are your number cards. Okay, so there's nine number cards. And then you have the face cards. Your face cards are jacks, queens, and kings. So there's three face cards in every suit. There's one card that's neither of those things, and that's the ace. Depending on games you play, sometimes ace is considered high, sometimes ace is considered low, and sometimes you get to pick depending on what's going on, like in blackjack. And if you don't know blackjack, it's okay. 
I know about this much. It's literally very little. Okay. Um, so that means that in every, since every card um, is in every suit, right, there's a three, for instance, of hearts. There's a three of hearts and a three of diamonds and a three of spades and a three of clubs. It means there's four threes. All right, so when somebody talks about four of a kind, that's what they're talking about is four of the same number, one in each suit. Okay, are you ready to take a look at some examples? Oh, let me actually start with um, one of the, the features of cards in general. Um, when you are playing any card game, I don't care if it's with a 52 card deck or whether it's old made, go fish, phase 10, throw in there anything else you want, doesn't matter. Skip bow, that's another one. Um, if you're playing any card game, what's the first thing you do when you're dealt a hand of cards? Shuffle it, right? You put it in some kind of order that makes sense for whatever game you're playing, right? Because you shuffle the cards and you put them in whatever order you want, it means that the order the person gave them, into, gave them to you in doesn't matter. Because you're just going to shuffle them into whatever order you want them to be in anyway, right? Everybody good with that? So everything we do with our deck of cards, which is not going to be every problem in your homework, it's not. I wish I could do a little bit more with some cards in there because I think they're, they're nice examples. Every card you know, example we do is going to have combinations. The order doesn't matter in which you get the cards. Everybody good? Okay, so here's our example, and we're going to start. So we have a standard 52-card deck, and we are going to have a five-card hand. So they're going to deal everybody cards. We're going to get five cards. And the first question is simply, how many different hands of cards are there? Okay, how many, how many different things could in, end up in your hand when you are dealt your hand of cards? Well, how many are there to pick from? 52, we already talked about it being a combination. And how many are you going to receive? Five. five. So this is 52 C5. So on the top, we're going to have 52 factorial. On the bottom, because it's a combination, we're both going to have the number of cards we pick with a factorial and the number of cards we don't get as a factorial. So we get five. How many do we not get? 47. 47. And when we're doing combinations, it's probably valuable to notice the denominator always adds the two features up to the numerator, right? right? It's the number you get, the number you don't get. It has to be the total number of cards that exist, or whatever the situation is, the total number of things that can exist. All right, so clearly 47, biggest value in the denominator. So we're going to write the numerator out until we get to 47, and we're going to stop. So 52, 51, 50, 49, 48, and 47 factorial. So I have the 47 factorial, and I'm going to write out my 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. 47s are going to cancel. Now what? Okay, so 5 um, and what do you want to do? 2? 5 and 2 make 10, right? 5 times 2 is 10. That'll cancel really nicely with the 50 to leave me with, where did I do about 5, right? Okay, what else? Okay, so 4 times 3 is actually 12. That's very nice, and that will go into 48. So we noticed that one. That's good. Uh, so 48 divided by 12 would be 4. So those paired up really nicely. They don't always, but this one did. So what do I have left? Well, I have a, I don't want to do that way. Um, I have a 52, a 51, a 5, a 49, and a 4. You should have gotten something like 2,598,960. Did you? Got some nods for those who checked. Good. That's a lot of hands of cards. That's 2.5, almost 2.6 million hands 
of carts. That's a lot. We only had 52. We should like, like really like that's a large number. It's a lot. So there are this many hands. B though says, what's the likelihood, right? How many different ways could you have ended up with a hand that's all red? Okay, well, it's not just this number divided by two because it's not just all red hands and all black hands, right? Most of the hands probably have both in them, correct? Yeah, I mean, statistically speaking, you're gonna end up with some of both most of the time. So if we wanna know how many hands contain only reds, what might we do differently? 26. Instead of having 52 we chose from, we would have half of that because only half of them are red. That's 26. C5. So there is a factor of half, right? Like a one half that gets, you know, goes in there, but it's not one half of the 2 million, it's one half of the 52. So on the top I have 26 factorial. And I have a 5 factorial on the bottom somewhere. I'll put it at the beginning like I did last time. What else do I have on bottom? 21. I do not get 21 of the cards. I do get five of them. So we'll write our 26 out to 21. And I have five, four, three, to one, just like last time. Cancel my 21s. What else can we cancel? Which one? Five goes into 25, leaving us with a five. Now what? Four times two is eight, and that goes into 24. Okay, four times two is eight, and that goes into 24. You could have also done four times three, and it would go into 24, so you have some choices. Uh, in fact, 4 times 3 times 2 is 24, isn't it? Yeah. So I think we can do all of them at once this time. That'll work nice. Cool. Uh, all right, so I'm left with a 26, a 5, a 23, and a 22. I don't have this one memorized. What is 26? 65,780. That's a big number, but it's nowhere near 2.6 million, right? It's not at all. It's much, much smaller. This is our number of hands. All right, so we're going to pare it down just a little bit more. Uh, there's no poker hand that just gives you like some sort of like kudos for getting all reds. That's not a thing. Um, but there is a poker hand where it matters if you get something like part C, which is all hearts. Does anybody know what it's called when you get all of one suit? Flush. A flush. Yeah, it's called a flush. So, um, and if you get all of one suit and it's the highest ones of the suit, royal. it's a royal flush, right? So there is benefit to having all hearts. There's no benefit to having all reds. So what's the likelihood that we get all hearts? Well, how many hearts are there? 13. 13. And how many cards am I supposed to be collecting? Five. Okay, so this is a fourth of the number before. But notice over here, when I halved the number I picked from, I did not take 2.6 million and divide it in half, right? And it did not work that way. So I don't expect this number to be anywhere near the 65,000 I just got because I'm dividing it in half that doesn't divide the outcome in half. So on the top, I have 13 factorial. What's on bottom? All right, I have eight and a five. I don't get eight of them. I do get five of them. That adds up to 13. And I'll write 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, and eight factorial. And then five, four, three, two, and one. 
factorials cancel. Now what? Four times three is twelve. And the five times two is ten. So this one is the numbers thirteen times eleven times nine. That's not very many compared to 2.6 million. I mean, it's a lot. I mean, thousands, not nothing. But it's pretty rare, right? This is a really good hand, and the reason it's good is because it's rare. Okay? Let's take a look at the next one. It's still on the screen. How about hands of all jacks? Okay, there are four jacks. That is correct. But I need five cards. It's not possible. You cannot get a hand of all jacks. Can you get a hand of four jacks? Well, sure you could. That's not what the question says. So do be careful on the wording of things, right? This says a hand, which is five cards, of all jacks. There aren't five jacks. So there are zero because there are only four jacks and I need five cards. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so don't just go. Uh, if you tried to do this, you probably would have very quickly written down something like this, right? There's four jacks, I need to pick five cards. That can't happen, right? Like think about the numbers here. I can't do four factorial on top and have five factorial on bottom and do any subtraction that makes any sense. The mathematics with the formula will fail you too. So there's some couple check steps along the way where you can realize, uh-oh, something's not working out right. Okay, so beware of that. Okay, so now let's do the four jacks with another card. All right, four jacks with another card. Well, it's any other card. So what do I do for four jacks and one card? Well, I need to pick the four jacks, and then I need to pick the any other card. So how do I get four jacks? Well, there's four to pick from, so it's 4C4. And then what do I need? Close. 48. I need one more card. Well, if I've already got the four jacks, or if I'm not counting the four jacks because I've already considered them in the first piece, there's 48 other cards. And I need one of them. And just like the fundamental principle of counting, I multiply these results together. It's almost like we did those lines and we said, how many ways can this happen? How many ways can this happen, right? Well, how many ways can I get my four jacks? That's 4C4. How many ways can I get one other card? That's 48C1, and I multiply the results. All right, 4C4 is lovely. Take a look. It's four factorial. How many cards am I picking? Four. How many cards do I not pick of the four I have to pick from? Two. Feels weird, but it's zero. And that's okay, because do you remember what zero factorial is? One. It is one. So it's not a problem that there is a zero in the denominator, because it's not zero. It's zero factorial. Now, 48 factorial on top for the other piece. I'm picking one of them, which means I'm not picking 47 of them. And you might look at this and think, okay, well, this might have been a bit overkill. If there are 48 cards and I'm picking one of them, how many different choices do I have? 48. 48 C1 is gonna be 48. You can see the 48 will cancel out as soon as I get to the 47. Also, this will very easily cancel out. I get a number one, because how many ways can I select from the four jacks if I need all four of them? Well, if I don't care what order I'm picking with, and I don't, there's only one way to do that. It means I gotta get all four jacks, right? So this piece is one, and this piece is 48. And if you wanna think about it in terms of the mathematics here, it's because you have 48 times 47 factorial and the 47 factorials cancel. You can think of that too from a formula perspective. 
there are 48 hands that are four of a kind jacks, specifically jacks. That is very uncommon, right? Compared to the 2.6 almost million hands that I have. 48 of them are all jacks. It's not common, right? Well, what about if we just want four of a kind? You know, it doesn't have to be jacks. It can be anything. Well, it could be jacks. It could be queens. It could be twos. It could be aces. How many different things could it be? It's not a question I'm asking right yet. How many different kinds of four of a kind are there? Thirteen. Why? Not suits, but cards. Yeah, there's 13 different sort of card values. We'll call them values, right? You have a value that goes from 2 to 10. That's nine cards. You have jack, queen, king. That's three more. You have ace. There are 13 different four of a kind options that would all be considered four of a kind, right? I could have four of a kind sevens. I could have four of a kind aces. I could have four of a kind anything. It doesn't matter. Four of a kind. So this question right here takes exactly what I did from the last part, right? Part, was it C, D, E, we're on E. Part E. And what it does is it multiplies by the number of different cards I have. It's 13. So it's really 13, and then I have the 4C4. That's the, once I pick the card, whatever it is, I need all of them. And then I have one additional something else that's in the deck, 48C1. But the 13 is coming from the fact that there are 13 different types of cards that could have been picked. And have that on the last problem, because the last problem I was told, jacks. Right? Specifically told jacks. You could do the same problem and be told face cards. Right? How many different four of a kind face card hands are there? Well, there's jacks, there's queens, there's kings, there's three different types. Where I have my 13, it would be a three. Okay? So, the only difference that would happen on this one is I'd have that 13, whoops, and then I'd have the 1 and the 48 that I had above, and what is 13 times 1 times 48? 624. Does it matter if we always include the 1? No, it doesn't matter on the 1s, yeah. Okay, all good? Okay, we're going to vary it just a little bit. Uh, another kind of hand of cards is called full house. Do you guys know what a full house is? It includes aces, but it has nothing to do with the cards themselves' values. That's called something else. That's called a straight. But you're right, that is something. We could look at a straight. A straight is going to be the numbers being in a row. There you go. So a full house is two of one of the cards and three of a different card. So it's like two aces and three fours, or three sevens and two queens, right? It's three of one and two of something else. So when we're looking at a full house, the first thing we do is much like we just did on the last problem where we don't know. We don't know if it's twos or threes or sevens or kings or aces. We don't know which means there's 13 different choices that we can make of which card we're talking about. But once we pick that card, how many of them are there? Four. There are four. No matter what it is, there are four of them, right? So let's pretend for a moment it's queens. How many queens are there? Four. And how many am I going to pick? It's either three or two. Pick your number right now. We'll go with two. I need two of that card. Okay, so this will get me two cards that match in their value, right? Two value cards that match. That's what this does. Any two value cards. So this would be like doing two of a kind. Whereas over here we did four of a kind, right? This one is two of a kind. 
but I need an additional three of a kind of something else. So I've already used one of my options. We said queen. How many other face card va value options, not face cards, but value options of the cards do I have? 12. There are 12 more values to pick from. First time I said queen, let's say this time we pick a seven. Okay? Okay, there was 13, 12 I had to pick from. I picked one of them, it's a seven. And I need how many, how many of those cards are there? Four, just like before, and how many am I going to pick? Three. And it doesn't matter if we had done 4C3 here or 4C3 here. We switch them and we're gonna get a, the same combination of things, like it's all gonna be there. It doesn't matter the order, because order doesn't matter. So I have 13 here, and then I have four on top, two and two on bottom. I have 12 here, and four on top, and three and one on bottom. These are small, right? I don't even know if you care about canceling, to be honest. They're very small values here. You can if you wish. Um, we can write this out. Four, three, two factorial, two factorial, two and one, if you wish. Um, I have 12, four, three factorial, three factorial. Looks like that. Um, you can divide the two with the four if you'd like. Something of this nature. So here's a 13. I have two times three or six in the second piece. I have 12 and I have four. So 13 times six times 12 times four. How many full house hands are there? 3,743. And again, that's not very many. But take a look at it compared to, and I'm going to flip back, so this is 3,744 compared to 624 hands that are therefore of a kind. This is how they make decisions about which hand is better. A better hand is a less likely hand to have happen. This hand four of a kind is less likely than a full house. So if we're playing poker and I have a full house and you have four of a kind, you win because your hand is rarer than my hand is. Does that make sense? Okay. We have one last question just to show some randomness to it. There's nothing special about this particular hand of cards. But we can do this for any arrangement, which is kind of what I want to point out here. This one says, okay, let's just say we have two black cards and two diamonds and a heart. Random assortment of things. It doesn't have any value, right? It's not like a winning hand of something. Just random. So we're going to go through it the same way. How do we get two black cards? Right, there's 26 of them, and I choose two. How do we get two diamonds? 13 C2, that's my diamonds. And how do I get my one heart? 13 C1, there's 13 hearts. Are you okay? I think you're thinking of over here when we changed the 13 to a 12, that's because we were changing the number of the card, okay. not the suit, that's what was happening, yep. Okay, so we've got 26 C2, so 26 factorial, what's on bottom? 24 factorial and Two factorial. 13 C2. What's on bottom? 11 and 2. And then 13 C1. I have 13 over 12 and 1. You can do one factorial if you wish. Okay. Uh, so on the first one, I'll write the 26 times 25, times 24 factorial, over 24 factorial, times two, times one. 
13, 12, and 11 factorial over 11 factorial, 2 times 1. And then 13, 12 factorial over 12 factorial times 1. This cleans up pretty quickly. The 24s cancel. 2 will cancel 26 to give me 13. So from the first piece, I get a 13 times 25. In the middle, the 11 factorials cancel. 2 cancels with 12 to give me 6. So I get a 13 times 6. And on the ending one, the 12 factorials cancel, and I get a 13. Okay. All right, so you're going to multiply 26 times 20, I'm sorry, 13 times 25 times 13 times 6 times 13. Lots of 13s. What will you get? 329,550 hands. And compared to everything else we were doing, that's not rare at all, right? Yeah, it's a much bigger number.